Welcome back to HANA Basics for Developers. <laughs> so we're ready to move on to sort of the next phase of our database development. We've seen how we can create basic database artifacts like tables and views. We've seen more complex and powerful artifacts like the HANA calculation view. But let's talk for a little while about SQL Script. Now SQL Script is SAP's uh, stored procedure language. Most every major DBMS has their own language that is a superset of SQL for creating stored procedures and being able to write both declarative and imperative logic within the database itself. And this is a core feature of HANA because we want to do more and more of the application logic inside the database. And to do that, we need a pretty rich programming language and that's where SQL Script comes into play here. Now, I'm not going to repeat everything about the basic concepts of SQL Script. Um, that's something that there's been several videos done before. Um, I'll link to some uh, specific videos from OpenSAP courses of the past um, for the basics of SQL Script. And fundamentally, SQL Script hasn't changed as much as some of the other topics. So I don't feel like I have to, you know, really update uh, the, the core concepts like we have for some of the other topics where they've been impacted by XSA or HDI. SQL Script fundamentally hasn't, hasn't changed, um, been, been changed by those outside forces as much. Um, but it has evolved and taken on uh, new features. So we will, like we've done in other sections, walk through some exercises that use SQL Script and use that to demonstrate um, basic capabilities. But I would recommend that you go uh, check out some of the other videos on the architectural and conceptual level first, and then come back and look at these specific examples. And these will be a little bit shorter videos uh, by its very nature, SQL Script, uh, unlike some of the other artifacts we've worked with, is, is a lot of coding, and, and you're not going to watch me type, so I'm going to cut and paste code in and then try to explain to you uh, what it's doing. Uh, but, but they will tend to be uh, more numerous, but, but shorter videos in this particular section. All right, let's start by just seeing a little bit of the mechanics of how we create and test a stored procedure. It's not going to be all that different than what we've done already with, say, calculation views or... or here we are. And uh, let's go into our database module and our source folder. And let's create a new subfolder just to keep things nicely organized. Let's call this uh, procedures. And inside this folder, let's create a new and we have a dedicated uh, option for this on the new menu. Let's create a new procedure. And let's call it get PO header data. And for some of these early examples, we're not going to do anything real amazing with the language. We're going to use basic SQL, but we're more concerned just uh, getting around the mechanics of, uh, of uh, setting up using SQL script and, and testing it. Okay. So let's, uh, let's actually go get source code here change over to my snippets and this is exercise block two and call this x217 seven, so let's bring the complete source code sample in and then we'll have a look at it so the anatomy of a procedure basically breaks down into a couple parts. We've got our, our header section or our signature, where obviously we give it the name of the procedure, and then we define any input uh, or output parameters. Uh, this one has no input parameters. It will only have output parameters. It's going to output a table of data, and then we're able to define that structure of that table in line. So we're going to return uh, four columns here. And actually, a stored procedure in HANA can have a couple different languages. Um, we could do them in R. Um, we can have uh, graph. 
the main one that we use is SQL script. That's, a, that's the main stored procedure language and the, and the one we're going to focus on in, in this course. Next we have SQL Security Invoker. There's two different types of security models for stored procedures. Uh, the default and the most common one is Invoker. That means whatever database user executes this stored procedure, that's who it's going to run as. The other option is SQL Script uh, uh, security, uh, SQL Security Definer. Uh, that's a bit more of a specialized use case, something you probably don't want to do very often. But what that's going to allow you to do is, um, regardless of what database user calls the procedure, it's going to execute at runtime as the user who created it, the, the definer. And that can be useful if you want to um, almost create like almost object-oriented, public-private uh, kind of method uh, approach to things where the the user running the procedure doesn't actually have the uh, rights to do what's inside the procedure. So maybe we're doing selects against tables and that user doesn't have the rights to, to do them, but you want to give them the rights to run the stored procedure. That way you've got a fixed interface that they the only way for them to get to a particular piece of data or perform an insert or an update is to go through the logic of the stored procedure. They can't just go to the SQL console and do it directly themselves. And therefore we can ensure referential integrity, perform extra validations before and after the update, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, so, so it's a, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting concept. It's something I've used a few times. Usually, when I want to do that sort of a, a public API kind of approach and hide uh, and control the inner logic. And then next is this read SQL data as. It basically says whether the uh, procedure is read only or not. So if it says read SQL data as, then it is a read only procedure. You can only perform selects can't create database objects, you can't do inserts, update, deletes, or dynamic SQL. That's that's considered um, not read-only. Even if all you're doing is a select in the, uh, in the dynamic, we can't know that until runtime, so therefore we have to treat it as though you could do anything in there. Um, if you wanted to turn this into a, to a non-read-only procedure, you would just take off this read SQL data and just have the as here. All right, um, now the rest of this logic this is basically selects. You know, we're doing a select from the PO header table with one set of criteria. We're doing a select count. Uh, you know, so we're getting all the uh, uh, the history created by and the history changed by records on the same table. This is where SQL script is 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 powerful and, and unique. You know, with regular SQL, you know, even if we have a view. We can only return one parameter and can't really have intermediate variables. Everything has to be done in a single join. And that's great for many use cases, but sometimes that can be too limiting. In SQL script, we can have intermediate results. So we can select from the same table twice with different criteria and get two different results. And then maybe use those results in a uh, select against another table, join them together. Uh, we can actually have multiple output parameters. We could return well, one or more tables. We'll, we'll see that in some of the uh, later exercises, but that's where it goes beyond just being a, a, a normal select. We, you know, with a select, uh, even with a join, you can only have one returned record set, and all the related objects in that in that record set have to be uh, put together via a join condition. Here, we could actually return results from multiple tables that have no relationship to one another. They don't have to be union. They don't have to be joined. Uh, and, and that's one of the main powers of, of SQL script. And we'll see some of the other unique capabilities of SQL script later as well. This isn't the only one. That's just uh, the one that we're coming across here. Now, I will uh, I'll point out once again, I mentioned earlier in the uh, calculation view table function exercise, you really got to ignore these client side error markers in SQL script uh, editor. It's unfortunate, but it is the situation. The client side error checker is just not very smart. Um, it doesn't know, you know, like for instance, here it's an unresolved table or view. Well, that table does exist. It's just uh, for whatever reason, the client side isn't smart enough to, to go into the database and find that yet. Later, you'll see on some of the other items, um, it doesn't understand all the newest syntax. So basically, I always just say, just ignore these error markers that you see on the client side and just trust the build process. 
because the build, the, the syntax check that happens on the server side when you perform a build, that works 100%. Uh, so you really only need to be concerned if you get error messages back out of the build. Uh, you can completely ignore these, these client-side error markers. Now, if you, if you would do something wrong, um, you know, let's, uh, let's maybe intentionally introduce an error here. And uh, let's build that again. Just uh, we'll just uh, do a selective build this time. So I've got an intentional error because obviously this column doesn't exist, and it should error up here in a second. There we are. We see it erred, and yes, I could go through this whole log and pick through it and find the error message. There it was. That wasn't too bad, um, but. One of the nice things that we have, and this is particularly useful for uh, SQL script because now we're getting coding line by line, uh, we don't necessarily want to pick through this whole HDI deployment log. We can instead use this problems view. When I click the problems view, it's going to take me directly to the error message, just like a traditional syntax kind of check would be. And it's letting me know that, uh, that this column is is not in the group by expression. It doesn't know what it is. And of course, you know, even if I had navigated away from this editor, I could uh, click on this item and it takes me right to that, that line item. Um, lets me know which, uh, which line the problem is on. If I mouse over it here, or here, it's letting me know that that's line 13, column 48. Uh, it took me right there, right where the error is. And now I can correct my error. I'll save. And we will rebuild that. And this time it's going to be successful. It's about done. It's successful. And our problems view has gone away. Now we still do have one warning, though, if you'd want to look at it. Um, oh, a type mismatch. Um, it's letting me know, you know, this is... Uh, this is nice if you want to see some of the warnings. It turns out that uh, the declared type of integer for create count doesn't actually match the uh, uh, the assigned type of uh, big big int. Uh, but that's okay. It, it a typecast, and that's a pretty safe typecast, uh, particularly with the amount of records that we have. I'm not worried about my count overflowing my integer, so we'll just go ahead and and stick with that for now. Okay. So we've got our uh, stored procedure. And uh, to test this, guess what? Database Explorer. It's now a runtime object. And we can go to our container, just like we did before. Now we can go to the procedures. And here we have our get PO header data. And if we want to, we can just say generate call statement. And this is just going to open up the SQL console. And, uh, and we've got our call. Uh, this is the, the SQL that you use to execute a stored procedure. You say call the stored procedure name, and then you've got the interface here where you can pass in or out parameters. If I run this, then there we are. We've got three records back. We've got the create count, we've got the change count, and we've got the combined count uh, for each of those logged in user IDs. So we've seen the, the basics of, uh, of SQL script, uh, regular store procedure, how to create them, a little bit about the syntax, um, and how to test it. In subsequent videos, we'll certainly go into more detail of some of the other and more powerful capabilities of